Hey guys, it's Dave from Howtech. Due to the current circumstances that we're all facing globally, uh, I have had to self-isolate myself away from everyone else. I'm not that disappointed. I get my own little space. So I was actually gonna wire this car up for a friend of mine, uh, but we've actually pushed this forward uh, because the marketing guys said, hey, why don't we take this great opportunity to make you do a video in front of everyone while you wire this car. So thanks, marketing guys. I really, really appreciate that. But we're gonna go through and do a quick step-by-step, wire-by-wire type guide so that you guys don't feel too threatened to take something like a wiring harness that looks like this, which can be very daunting to a lot of people. Uh, it's one of the funniest comments I often get when I've got a harness like this in front of me and people just go, are you serious? Um, so we're gonna go through this and break this down bit by bit to show that it's not that daunting to go through and tackle your project yourself. So this is a really quick snippet of some of the tools that help me get the job done when we're trying to wire up a car. Um, we can just go through them really, really quickly. Um, wire strippers, really, really important. Really important to get a really nice pair of wire strippers. Um, these are from JCAR, just an electronics store here in Australia. Um, there'll be very, very similar stores wherever you are in the world. Um, every country has them, I'm almost positive. Otherwise, ordering online, just to get a good pair of wire strippers is essential to get the job done really, really well. Crimpers, um, these are actually Haltex crimpers. Um, we sell these in sets on our web store. Um, the link will be up in either this video or one of the next videos. Essential to get the job done. If you don't have a good set of crimpers, don't even start it's not gonna be worth your time. You're not gonna have a fun time. These will help do all the sensor pins or the ECU pins that you need to do. Um, any relay stuff, um, the, these will come in more handy than you can ever imagine. They are very, very important. A good set of cutters or uh, side cutters or angled cutters, very, very important too. Um, I often have more than one uh, around me as you will see here in this video, because I will lose all four of these in this job, well and truly. Um, so it's always good to have at least one good pair of side cutters and somebody else will come and get them while I'm asleep. Um, somebody else will take them off to cut some metal somewhere off in the car park. So always good to have a good set nearby. These are Deutsch crimpers. Um, these are really, really handy for all the Deutsch pins that come with a lot of our kits. Um, for all the solid uh, round pins that we supply, that's what these are gonna be for. Very, very popular in aftermarket uh, wire-ups. Um, these normally come from EFI Hardware, uh, which is another Australian-based company. Um, very, very popular, so you'll be able to find these online everywhere as well. I've got my hole saw here. My hole saw is going to help put a hole where I need to run the harness through in this vehicle. Um, again, hardware store, very, very easy. A sharp Stanley knife for cutting back heat shrink or fixing a mistake that we make because we're all human. We are going to make mistakes, so this will help get the job done. These are pin removal tools. Again, if we need to make any edits, um, or revisions in the harness that we've made a mistake, these are very, very handy for this as well. So if we've got a bad connector that we need to replace or we've just happened to put the pin in the wrong hole because it's late or it's dark and you just happen to ma uh, mess it up, these will be really, really handy. Um, again, uh, EFI Hardware or many other electrical stores. Allen keys, self-explanatory. Drill bits, again, self-explanatory. Cable ties, we will go through probably a lot of these actually. We'll make the cable tie man very, very rich, but these help neaten up the loom and make it look pretty professional. Um, having a good quality set of tapes is very, very important as well. 
cheap electrical tape is good for doing handyman things. When we're doing electrical work, it is very, very important to use a good quality electrical tape. There's nothing worse than getting into a loom and seeing just goo from a bad quality tape just everywhere because it doesn't stand up to heat very well. So make sure you get a very, very good quality tape. Um, we've got a labeler to help label some things on the loom if we need to. Um, some people love the look of a labeled loom. Some people don't. They like a nice, neat, clean uh, engine bay without many labels. So we will talk to the owner and see if he wants any labels. A multimeter is also a really good tool to find out what end of this wire where it is over there. So it's always a really, really good tool to help find continuity between different wires because we've all seen that job or that mate who said, I'll give your wiring job a go and it's changed colors 16 times down the loom and nobody actually knows where this wire actually goes in the car. So this is quite helpful. Um, a really good quality light um, is also gonna be really essential for the job. Um, getting under dashes, under cars, in really tight nooks and crannies to try and find what you're looking at. Don't wing it, absolutely use a light and do the job right the first time. A good quality heat shrink, uh, a dual wall heat shrink is often very, very good or a glue lined heat shrink is really, really helpful for really nice tight um, heat shrunk looms. Um, using normal heat shrink inside the loom is really, really great because it's very compact, but making sure the job is secure and that the, uh, your, your coverings are all secure to protect your engine loom um, is very, very important. To shrink our heat shrink, um, having a little burner is very, very helpful to get that um, heat shrink shrunk nicely, neatly, without burning the surrounding components of that loom. Um, a heat gun is also essential for that sort of stuff too. So um, depending on where you're actually doing the job, sometimes a heat gun is not handy. Sometimes a little, little gun is very handy. Um, it's just about learning how to use it properly to get the best result in your environment. They're probably the main tools that I use. Um, there is a lot of other wiring things around. Um, we'll go through those in the next couple of days. This is gonna be a enthusiast level wire install. Um, for all things very, very serious in motorsport, this is probably not gonna be the right material for what you're gonna use, the right sort of tools that you're gonna use. Uh, you're actually gonna use a much more professional level spec tool set and wire choice or wire material. Um, for all that level of motorsport wiring and how to, um, definitely recommend the High Performance Academy modules for wiring. Uh, they have a great set of tuning courses um, and recently I've watched a lot of the wiring videos. Um, they're incredible, so Zach does an amazing job. Um, definitely head across to their website. Um, they've got some courses which are very, very affordable and they just go through every single part of the wiring and what you would need to make a beautiful, professional looking wiring harness. This is the car. This is a 1979 to 82, somewhere in there, XD Ford Falcon. Um, as you can see, there are a few essential components of this car that are missing. Uh, like I said before, we brought this wiring forward uh, simply because I had the opportunity to do it uh, earlier than I thought. Um, so therefore, the owner hasn't actually finished a lot of this engine but it, it does actually give us a lot more accessibility to everything in and around the engine, which is gonna be really, really helpful. Uh, running wires where there's not a complete car is also very, very helpful. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes I happen to run wires where there is a very essential component of the car, so it's always a really good uh, decision to try and get as much information about where things are actually gonna go in the car uh, as early as possible. But we're gonna give it a go, uh, just in its current form. All right, let's talk about the engine that's in this car. Uh, maybe a little bit controversial. Maybe some people don't believe that an LS belongs in a car like this. Uh, you can see why the LS is such a popular engine in most transplants these days. Um, 
very small, very narrow. I've never seen this much room behind an LS engine ever in my life in any transplant I've ever seen. Um, so much room for activities, as I say. Um, recently we had another workshop owner come by and he said he actually fitted one of the forward engines, uh, like a Boss engine, which is a dual overhead cam or a single overhead cam. I'm not sure which engine it was, but he said it essentially came out to about here. So they actually had to modify all of these strut towers and do a lot of fabrication, which does add up really, really quickly, um, just to make that engine fit in this engine bay. So the owner picked a nice, compact, small engine. Um, let me know what your comments are as to whether this engine belongs in this car or doesn't belong in this car. We'll, we'll go through it and we'll find it interesting together. So start the debate. Normally we have to think about wiring the taco to keep the taco working. In this original car, we used to have the taco run off the coil negative um, of the ignition system. Um, we, don't, we don't have to worry about it that this time simply because the owner has decided to completely ditch the taco altogether. Um, the coolant gauge, the vehicle speed, everything is missing because we're going to run the IC7 display dash instead. Um, as a wiring guy, that makes our job so much more easy because all we're going to do is plug in the CAN communications between this and the ECU and they'll basically talk to together and then we will have all of that display information on the IC7. As far as this void which is missing, the cluster is currently at 3D Racing Solutions. Um, Sam has graciously uh, volunteered his time to actually design a new cluster for the XDXE um, Falcon models I guess. Um, so when he's done measuring up that, he's gonna draw it into his CAD system and then he's gonna bring over the first prototype hopefully in the next few days so that we can test fit it and see how the IC7 fits nicely into this cluster um, so that we can use it for a full functional display. Let's get into the harness and we'll break it down so section by section, I guess, not wire by wire. That'll get a little bit tedious. It is often a really good idea to have a big working space. Uh, if you can have a bench, which is um, a good depth um, and a good length, planning is key when it comes to having a neat wiring loom. If you just run this in the car and then make it up as you go, don't get me wrong, it will work. Um, it just won't be as neat as you might like it to be. Um, if you can plan as much inputs and outputs and you can have everything designed in such a way that it actually looks really neat, you end up with a nice professional looking wiring harness, which is really what everyone wants. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through and just make sure that we, we've got a map set up in our ECU before we even put this loom into the car. We're gonna set it all up on the laptop and have a pre-made wiring, I guess you would call it an input-output schematic that is all done in the software for the Elite ECU. We do this ahead of time and then wire from what we plan inside the map. We've got a whole bunch of little labels which basically tell us what each input is and pre-designed uh, pre for. So this one is called the O2 input number one, which is on ABI 6. And if we pull out our um, wiring diagram that comes in the ECU box, we can see how this is wired down at the actual ECU connector end. So that'll be cool to go through as well. So I'm just gonna go through the loom and pick out all the white labels. Uh, these white labels, like I just said, um, have all the separate functions and what each of those wires does. Um, the beauty of starting with the Haltech Premium Loom is that we, we pre-bunch everything together. So for the injectors, all the injector wires are all together. Ignition, they're all bunched together. So you've got a power and you've got all the signal wires. Uh, so these are all pretty much pre-laid out. They just turn into a little bit of a spaghetti sometimes during shipping and packaging. So what we're gonna do is just go through them 
spread them all out and then we can start from a nice, neat base together. So I've gone through and I've separated each of the wiring labels uh, in the loom and just tried to make it as neat as I could. Uh, we've got our digital inputs here, which we've set aside. This will be great for a flex fuel sensor, which we're gonna run in this car. Um, digital inputs are also good for some simple switches. Um, so we might do a couple of the steering wheel switches through them. Uh, a speed sensor, also really, really helpful for that sort of stuff. When we go through the ECU um, pinouts together, this will tell us what we can and cannot wire to very specific digital inputs. One of the most popular questions that we often get through our tech support uh, emails and on the phone is, can I run this sensor through this input? Or will this input allow me to do this or this or this. The best part about the software is it restricts you to running certain sensors on certain inputs. So uh, there aren't really a lot of rules as to what you can or can't run on particular inputs, but the software does go through that very, very well. So we'll do that later on. Got my fuel pump wire. Um, in this installation, because I know already we've got two fuel pumps to run, I'm not gonna use the fuel pump wire for the fuel pump. We're gonna repurpose this for something else later, but we'll do that later on when we, uh, when we do some mapping. We've got the crank and cam sensor, or trigger and home, as we call it in Haltech. Uh, this will go to the cam and crank sensors on the engine. When we set the engine up inside the ECU, so the ECU knows what engine it's gonna start, we're gonna tell it what trigger pattern this engine has. Uh, so that'll help the ECU run this uh, engine for us. Uh, we've got a couple of analog voltage inputs here, which I uh, briefly mentioned before for the AVI-6. We're gonna repurpose one and six to run our pressure sensors. Because we don't have wideband or uh, O2 inputs that we're gonna be wiring in, we're gonna use a CAN uh, wideband, the Haltech CAN wideband. So they actually plug in externally to any of this wiring harness, which just makes the job really, really easy. That also gives us a couple of inputs back in our loom to use for something else. So we're gonna repurpose them for oil and fuel pressure. Uh, we're gonna add a fuel pressure sensor onto the fuel reg of this car and we're gonna use the factory oil pressure, which is on this engine. If you wanted to use uh, oil pressure on your engine, you would buy one of the TI or motorsport sensors for oil pressure from us. And then with that, we give you a guide on which wire goes on what spot on this connector. Um, we're gonna do that in the next few episodes together. Um, so that's what they're gonna be pre-assigned for in our map. The map sensor is an external map sensor. Um, you've actually got the option on the 2500 to use the internal or the external map sensor. On this car, we're not gonna be running a lot of boost pressure for now. Plans always change, but the internal map sensor on the ECU is good for 30 PSI. This engine and this turbo in this setup is not gonna be running anywhere near that. So we might actually repurpose this external map sensor for something else fun, maybe like a boost trim switch or anything else. Again, the ECU will tell us exactly what we can and cannot do with this wire and this input. The air temperature and coolant temperature, again, pretty self-explanatory. That will just go one on the inlet and one in the coolant temp. The, re the coolant temp has actually been relocated in this installation to keep it away from the dump pipe and the uh, exhaust heat in this particular application. So you can actually move it to the back. So that's where we're gonna move this coolant temp sensor. Wire input two. This input here has been pre-set up for throttle position. So in a cable throttle position, so on an LS1 engine, this would have a predestined uh, input already set up. This is a drive-by wire application, so we're actually not gonna use this input for that specific cable throttle. We're gonna use one of the 
other analog voltage inputs. And we're gonna use two for the throttle body because that's what the computer needs to run, a uh, drive-by-wire throttle. And we're gonna use two of these inputs for the electronic pedal as well. Um, each of these pedals and throttle bodies for an electronic drive-by-wire condition, they actually need both, two up there and two down at the pedal. That's a safety uh, parameter within the ECU itself. We only do this because that's what factory designed. Um, so we're just following how those designs are all done from uh, factory-based applications. We've got a switched 12-volt install uh, wire. This comes from the actual key barrel in the car. Um, you'll notice that when you turn your key on first to accessories, then on or ignition, and then you have a spring starter, um, this will go to the on or the ignition. This stays on while we're cranking the car and not, it does not get wired to the accessories. If you accidentally wire this one to the accessories, you'll crank the car and the ECU will turn off. So your car will never start. So it's important that we're gonna try and find the right place to wire this one as well. So we'll do that with either a multimeter or we'll do it with our power probe. And I'll show you how to use that later on as well. We've got our eight injector um, outputs here as well. Uh, and the power wire that is already pre-wired through a relay in our fuse box. It just makes the job really, really easy. So there's no mucking around with relays or pre-configuring any of that wiring. That's already done for, them, for us in our premium loom. So we've got those and we just need to figure out which one's injector. One, two, three, four, etc. on the actual engine itself later on. With the Howtech ECU, we always wire it in cylinder order not firing order. We preset the firing order in the setup page. Um, the LS base map is fantastic for that because it does everything for us already. Likewise, same with the ignition wires. We're gonna use our power wire to power all these coils. These are internally, uh, these have got internal modules in the coil. Um, so there's not an external ignition module that we ha have to wire up for this particular application. LS coils are fantastic for exactly that reason. They're compact, they're actually very, very powerful and can generate a lot of uh, spark energy um, and simple to wire as well. All these will require is now is a ground that will go to the cylinder head and that we're pretty much done. So that makes it really, really easy. In other applications where you've got a factory coil like a Ford coil, like a Barra coil, or one of the V8, uh, one of the V8 Ford coils, you actually need an external module to then wire up the signals into that module, then back out of that module up to your coils. It's just a whole nother wiring step which just takes time. That module also costs money, so sometimes reusing factory modules that may be or may not be reliable is a, a, a tricky one to add into that equation. So um, it's just more cost. So if you can use an internally modular coil, it does save a lot of time and a lot of money. We've got some outputs pre-assigned for a stepper motor or a idle control motor. Um, we don't have one of these on this car. Uh, LS1, however, had a four wire stepper motor, which actually moves backwards and forwards and the ECU controls that that controls the idle speed of the engine. With the drive-by-wire system, we're actually gonna do all the idle control through the drive-by-wire throttle. Uh, so we get to use these as anything else that we want in the car. I'm gonna pre-wire and assign these as the fuel pump outputs. And we're gonna run these to the back of the car and control relays down at the back of the car. Uh, the other two might be free for something else altogether. So we can, uh, either use them for something fun or we can take them out of the loom altogether or because plans always change I can put these into a connector that's going to be ready if we want to do something in the future all we need to do is make some pins and another connector on the other side of that later to do something interesting later more outputs for other interesting things that need to be done on a car. Normally you would need at least a taco wire. A taco would control the factory taco in the dash. Um, sometimes depending on what installation we're trying to do, the vehicle speed 
might need to be controlled as well. So we can take control of that. Uh, we've got a boost control solenoid that we need to control the boost on this car with. We might need to control an idle motor, which is not a stepper motor. Uh, Subaru were very common, Ford also very common to have a two or three wire idle speed BAC motor or bypass air control. Um, so not a four wire stepper motor. Uh, Toyota, Mitsubishi also very, very common to use four wire or six wire stepper motor. Uh, very common for the Subaru models to have a two or three wire idle control motor. So we will go through and pre-assign these as to whatever we need when we figure out what, whatever we need to run this engine. Uh, I've got two knock sensor inputs, one for the left bank and one for the right bank or the driver's side or passenger side. We've got the two drive-by-wire outputs. Um, these two will be joined up with another two wires for the analog inputs that go up to the throttle body, a signal ground and a five volt. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that later on, um, but basically that's what these two wires, this is to make the throttle body go whip, whip, and you'll hear the calibration process a little bit later as well. Battery positive, pretty self-explanatory there. This is where the power for the relay box and the ECU all comes from. So this is very important to get this right. Battery ground, also very important. Um, this one, not as self-explanatory. Uh, Matt's star grounding video that we did very, very recently will help with where this actually needs to go. So that might be another cool link that we can uh, go to and, and do some research to figure out why battery grounding is so important in every single ECU installation. Just putting my bed together for the next two weeks. As uh, I won't be going home, I'll uh, be intently wiring this car to get it done, because uh, I just really want to get it done and out of my life. Um, in here, we've got some trans brake buttons because this has got a turbo 400 in it um, so we've got some shifter stuff we've got to work out and starter position lockouts so that we don't start the car in gear so there is a bit of stuff we'll go through um, this interior is disgusting but i'm sure i will be disgusting after two weeks in this car great <laughs>